are you capable of running harder than everybody else and, and working smarter as you start to build success? If you make $20,000 one day, are you gonna come in and do the same thing tomorrow? And then B, that you know, you have to have a high moral compass. And if you have those things and a tremendous amount of character, then really we can take care of the rest. You know, you just have to be the one to grind and to, to have the heart to do it, right? And have tough conversations. What's up, everybody? My name is Tyler Harris. Thank you for joining the Sales Wolves podcast. This is episode 69. And as I said, I am Tyler Harris. This is Jillian Wells. And we also have Megan Wolke. And we collectively are the Sales Wolves. I'm probably going to be the only one that howls. Ow! <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining in, guys. So, <laughs> this is the Sales Wolves podcast. It looks a little bit different today. I feel a little bit outnumbered today in this wolf pack here uh, that we have. Um, but I just got back from an incredible event out in Huntington Beach called Disruptive Innovation, part of the Disrupt Tour. And the cool thing about that is Megan, who we'll introduce here uh, in a second, I believe that whole idea may have come from you as far as how this name was established, uh, but it was an extremely, extremely powerful uh, event uh, geared towards insurance, financial services, real estate, and how to market like the year that we actually live in. And the whole idea is, are you going to be disrupted or are you going to be the disrupt tour? And definitely want to bring on uh, Megan here because she is a disrupt tour 1000% through and through. And during her speech, she gave a keynote at the event. I was just enthralled, like I was all in, I was leaned forward, I took a bunch of notes uh, during her speech and it was just incredible. Uh, but we'll bring her on, she is head of recruiting for Mutual of Omaha and what we want to talk about today is just this idea of how do you recruit and then retain talent mm -hmm. in 2018. And I love kind of the framework that Megan put around that with her speech. Uh, but we'll get into some of that. But Megan, if you want to come on and, uh, and introduce yourself, tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and we'll get right into it. Sure, thank you very much. And it, it was um, an absolutely outstanding Friday last week at the Disrupt Tour, and I took so much away just on top of the content, the relationships, and, and the opportunity to know the people that I follow a little bit better or on a more personal level, just really helps you to connect with their content. And so that was very special for me to be a part of as well. Uh, the, the talk that I gave focused a lot on my background uh, as a disruptor, you know, no uh, pun intended, but you can feel a little bit like a lone wolf from time to time. And, you know, I found it very uh, beneficial for me to be a part of the agenda because people like you, Tara, uh, Tyler, were talking about a lot of tactics, either relevant to real estate or insurance. Um, but you saw some folks in there, and, and I've since followed them on Instagram, especially, and I see that they're that, that they have four you know posts and new to you can tell based on their followers might not be as active. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was really um, important for me to maybe take a little bit more vulnerable stance than what I normally take to yeah. share my story because disruption starts long before you have the opportunity to show how much you know through data and results. Mm -hmm. And especially in, in my background, there were a lot of courageous leaps that uh, brought me a lot of success that I'm, I'm very grateful for. Absolutely. And so what I want to start is with that very first picture. I know we can't show everybody the picture, but did you call it, was it called a hip pock? Is that what you actually called that move? Um, I call it a hip cock, but hip -cock. I would later Got it. Um, correct that it's a hip pop. Okay, hip pop. Either way, yeah, either <laughs> way, that was a, a good childhood picture that uh, I represented that as a little bit of a spitfire. My entire life. She had this More family. This she had this family picture, and it was like last second, right before they clicked the camera. She just like throws her hip out, puts the thumb in in the uh, <laughs> in the side, and just like totally just 
put some swag, it. throw some <laughs> swag into it. <laughs> and I think yeah. it was like some acid wash jeans with like some, um, some like, what kind of boots? The boots had like tassels like, or something. Fringe oh. boots. Fringe yeah, boots. No, it's <laughs> very, very much a, a country family, horses in the photo. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, we were a pretty, um, a pretty popular family because our town was, you know, thousand people at that age where we lived it was a very small town um and so everybody looks pretty buttoned up except for me <laughs> so take us a little bit i know we don't have time to kind of go through your whole talk but take us a little bit on that kind of timeline um over the years of kind of what turned you into this disruptor uh that you are now so you know the timeline obviously you, you point back to that i was born this way because i think You've got to have a certain kind of heart to mm. disrupt on purpose. That was really what I wanted to connect there is disruption isn't just being ornery, although I am a little bit of that as well. <laughs> um, disruption is having a tremendous amount of courage and also having um, high beliefs. So if you follow like the Gallup surveys, being a high believer is something that actually gets me in trouble more than <laughs> it probably helps me where you know, if I believe something is right, I'm going to fight for it. Or if I believe I might be headed on um, down the wrong path, then I'm going to fight for it, sometimes even to my own detriment. And that was with chapter one. You heard me share the story about my fear of, of suddenly rebellion. It had felt good my entire life because I always wanted to work harder than everybody else, run faster, be better. But then around the high school years in a small town, like everybody else, rebellion was the norm and it was starting to look um, like it didn't align with my values. And, and after a deal with my parents, um, you know, and some pretty strong test scores, obviously you can't just pull it off if, if uh, <laughs> you don't have the academia to back it up. But um, I dropped out of high school and went to college early. And that was the first time I had announced that so publicly Wow. Um, some people know about it. My own staff in the front row, they just went. They, <laughs> That's wow. awesome. And that was kind of fun to see. Uh, threw me off a little bit, actually, from a speaking <laughs> standpoint, because it was kind of funny. Um, but the point behind that is that, you know, if you're going to make a decision to do something different from everybody else, there are going to be a ton of unintended consequences and a ton of um, potential success or potential failure. And for me, that meant that I got to pursue a dream, um, an athletic passion that I had at the time to compete nationally. And I learned how to rebrand myself and I learned how to, um, you know, I was a true capitalist with my brother in our sport. We would raise horses and sell horses and do it all over again, um, how to earn our own income at a, at a young age and support our, our habit. And so I think the, the point behind that was just that you know, if you go to, I don't know if you've been to a lot of the management events in our industry, and I have, I've been a, a, um, an active participant and a huge believer in Gamma, for instance, since 2010. Okay. But there are a lot more tattoos on Friday than there ever are. And, <laughs> That's and, true. You now, I say that loosely, but there is this image of who qualifies to be in financial services and who doesn't. Hmm. And chapter one was really my way of saying that if you think you have to be totally buttoned up and you have to have a finance degree and uh, you know this spot-free background, then you're wrong because financial services is all about, A, are you capable of running harder than everybody else and, and working smarter as you start to build success? If you make $20,000 one day, are you going to come in and do the same thing tomorrow? And then B, that, you know, you have to have a high moral compass. And if you have those things and a tremendous amount of character, then really we can take care of the rest. There's a lot of, the products aren't that tough to figure out, especially because there are some people in this building that are like brilliant and super geeky about it. One's like sitting next to me. So... <laughs> You know, you just have to be the one to grind and to, to have the heart to do what's right and have tough conversations. You just said something that was so, um, so brilliant. And I just, it just hit me. You said, 
the willingness or ability to work harder and then smarter when the success came and holy crap like that like that's like my story like i did not work smart in the beginning but i was willing to outwork everyone and when the success came along with that then i was able to get smarter and obviously be able to work less time and get more results but in the beginning it was just like we we need someone to come in that just puts their head down and goes to work like you don't have to know it all. Yeah. Like your your right. conversion ratio can be low if you just go see ten times more people than everybody else. And that was kind of always my role. Like if my conversion's ten percent, yours is ninety. I'm going to go see ten times more people and beat you every week. Like that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And then over you time, don't know what smarter means until yeah. you get more integrated into your market. That's so funny. It's like I never even really thought about it that way. It's like you can't work smarter until you've already worked harder. <laughs> and know how hard everybody. you have to work to make that happen. Know what the work yeah. is in it to work smarter and not harder too. It's like you don't even have a benchmark to go off of. <laughs> it's right, like, right. like the benchmark is the crazy hard work and then by working smarter you're able to see like okay now it only takes up this fraction of that time or this fraction of that time. But most people go into it and they're like all right, I got to work harder and smarter at the same time and let me figure out everything. And then they have this, you know, paralysis of analysis mm -hmm. and they just never get started and never go all in. It's interesting. You know, there's a, um, a lot of people that I really admire in this business and, and owe a lot to certainly as well. But, um, Harry Hoopis is well known in our, in our industry from a management perspective. And he has this analogy that really, I think resonates well with <clears throat> what we're talking about here. And this is actually one of the tactics I'll, I'll share with you in a little bit. But he said, if I gave you, you know, I can't remember what he used, but let's say a, a fork or a butter knife and said, you had to chip your way through this brick wall. And I can't tell you how thick the wall is, but I can tell you that your greatest dreams are on the other side of it. Would you do it? You need the people that are like, yeah, <laughs> like totally. Why, you know, why wouldn't I Absolutely. do it? And I think, that's, you know, we do have a, um, a symptom, especially as we get more successful in this business. And this is part of the chapter two lessons that um, tactically I want to share on the heels of Disrupt Tour, that we're at a point where you know, sometimes I can work smart, but there's still certain elements of my role where I'm still just running faster mm. and harder than everybody else because I haven't figured out how to work smart yet. Um, and if I were to focus on trying to figure out how to work smart, I would fall behind and I wouldn't be recognized as um, a thought leader in many of those cases. And so we sometimes slow our own advisors down by mm. asking them to work smarter in ways that we're able to work smart when they really haven't earned it yet. Um, that's and that's so something cool. that I truly believe is, is a good message to share on the heels of this conference. It's so true. There's certain strategic times, but not until success has been created where you have to slow down to speed up, slow down to speed up. But the problem is most people don't get to that time period where they've had those periods of success. Some people are just sitting back waiting for, you're handing them the fork and tell them to go through the wall, but they're saying like, well, no, I want the, I want the sledgehammer. Like, and they just sit there waiting right. for the sledgehammer and they never get the opportunity. And so they just sit there and never even, never even start scratching away at it. That's interesting. Um, right. When you talked about your first kind of parlay into the financial industry, I remember it was funny because you said like financial advisor, you're like, I'm not very good at math. <laughs> you're like, so this doesn't sound like a, this doesn't sound like the greatest of, of ideas. It sounds awful. <laughs> yeah. So, but what did that look like when you did, you know, start kind of your first uh, career in financial services? You were still in college, correct? I was. Okay. I was. I was a, I was a student. Um, I was 21 and I prospected my face off, man. Mm. I mean, I, I just had to talk to so many people yeah. and the problem was, and this is as our recruiters, but depending on your organization, they focus sometimes on natural market recruiting. Hmm. So we want people, um, you know, we, we focus on not, we don't want you to come in and talk to all your friends and family, but rather we want to understand what types of markets you have a natural affinity to so that we can then um, integrate you into that market. And for me, that was either farmers, because I come from a cattle family, or people my age who 
didn't have any money. <laughs> right. you know, nobody was like student loans, maybe. <laughs> um, and so I had to prospect really hard to relate to the um, the generations that were young professionals. That was actually more difficult than uh, my parents' generation after I figured out what my edge kind of was. Hmm. And, you know, it, it I said it and, and the group did laugh, but it was actually kind of a last resort. The, the, the initial big client that I got, you know, I said he had a, a large amount of wealth to transfer to, um, to his children. And you could tell that um, he had an advisor who he'd worked with a really long time. But as soon as I communicated to him, you know, hey, look, the odds of me outliving you are a lot greater than the odds of your advisor outliving you because I'm super young and he's not. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, I said it a little more softly than that, of course. But, <laughs> Just a little. Um, you could see that all of a sudden it dawned on him, like, holy crap, I'm building this legacy. And then it's going to be gone because my children aren't, aren't ever going to connect with this, this advisor that I have. And so what the edge really was for me was that the plans and the products and the solutions that we put in place were really the prerequisite to where my involvement had its biggest value, which was that I could help execute on what those, what the insured really wanted to happen if they had to leave the world early or when they left the world. Hmm. And that was an edge for me that, that really set everything in motion because I became an expert in understanding, okay, which one of your family members or children is going to be the one that's most likely to cause relationship or dynamic issues among the family. Hmm. What do I need to do to get a relationship with them so that we can communicate? What's the best way to contact them? So it was, um, it was really going really deep to get to know who the people that might involve themselves in executing on the plan um, are and how to get in front of them so that that insured knew when they're signing that premium check every month or every year, that they know that really what they're paying for is that they still have a voice when they're gone. And that was a huge calling card for me. And it just, things absolutely took off after, after that uh, moment for me. Wow. And so you had incredible success. I mean, you were, you, I mean, you crushed like every single top advisor for this, top agent for that. Uh, let's talk about kind of your transition out of the sales role into uh, the corporate side, because that's never easy. Uh, and it's always very, very, very different. And it's because it's a complete yeah. mindset switch. Um, so let's talk about that because that will kind of parlay into the whole conversation um, of recruiting uh, and retention of of um, of agents. So what did that look like for you, and and what was that a difficult process for you? Initially, uh, as I as I moved from an agent to an advisor in the field, or excuse me, to a recruiter in the field. That was not as tough of a transition. Actually, I said no a couple of times, and uh, we were living in Nebraska at the time, newly engaged, and I didn't really realize the relationship dynamics. You should probably talk to your fiance about that as I was saying no. And so as soon as, um, as, soon as my husband figured out, he said, you said no to what? So we, uh, we explored it a little bit more deeply, and I'll be honest, uh, moving from Nebraska to Arizona, I did not anticipate um, A, really being as good at recruiting as I am, but B, I did not anticipate enjoying it or staying there for a long time. I kind of thought I would help them build the agency for three to five years and replace myself and by that time have a natural market and go right back into personal production. Um, but I've always kept my eyes open for detours on career paths. And after, uh, at about the three year mark, after some really successful years in the Phoenix office for Mutual of Omaha, I was approached to step into the home office role to be on a part of our, uh, our team here. And that was something that was really life changing for me, but very rocky. You know, one of the things that I think a lot of the people in our field offices don't understand, but then also some of the people in our um, home office don't understand if, if folks are coming from the field is that you start to question if you're in the right place 
hmm. or lose some of your momentum the further away you get from the customer. Hmm. So there are still, as a high believer, right, there are still projects where I get very frustrated and I have to tap on certain people in my team to help remind me of, okay, here's why we're doing this. Yeah. Here's how long it's going to take before you feel like you're impacting lives because it just, there's, there's something for me waking up and, and working as hard as I do, or after my kids going to bed, turning you know my laptop back on and getting back to work, that I need to be able to connect it with the lives I feel like I'm saving or else I kind of lose my, um, lose my patience and then I'm not as effective at communicating. And that was part of the rocky transition for me in home office and I still struggle with it. Um, today I have to work really hard at managing my my passion and my emotions at, to make sure that I have the right relationships and that I communicate why I feel so um, excited or passionate about accomplishing certain things. That's awesome. So let's just dive right in to some of these tactics or some of the kind of hits and misses on recruiting talent um, in 2018. And this is part where I'll probably like take a little bit of a step to the side since Jillian, which I don't think I even introduced, she heads up all of our recruiting um, here at Consolidated uh, Assurance and her office is right next to this uh, studio. Um, but this is what she's doing on a daily basis and I'd love for you guys to be able to kind of talk about um, just the day in and day out of of finding these people. I know you said a lot of yours are coming from outside the industry, which is this very, very similar to us, and mm -hmm. we actually like that. Um, so so what, does that, what does that look like, and what are some of those obstacles, and what are some of those tactics that people can use to uh, become better at, re at not only retaining the talent that they have, but bringing in fresh new talent on a daily basis? Good question. I mean, I think there are there are some philosophies that that have really helped in recruiting inexperienced advisors, and then there are some tactics. And this is kind of a good intro to that on the heels of Disrupt Tour for each one of the chapters I shared. I'll be sharing specific tactics, and so awesome. this is um, some of the tactical content that I'll go in um, and share for Chapter Three, Chapter Four. The the philosophy is, that attracts and experienced advisors the most is that is one that relies heavily on culture. And you know, you heard Adam Mockett talk about how his what his environment is like, and if you follow him, that really busy environment attracts inexperienced advisors because the majority of them are millennials. Yep. But then another kind of philosophical thing I've noticed really turn the corner for us is the um, the value that the organization can add in them being experts in marketing. Because we have been also stereotyped as a millennial generation as really loving the entrepreneurial path. But I think sometimes we, we don't consider that, yeah, I wanna be an entrepreneur, but I don't, I wanna sell this stuff and I wanna be the face and the name behind it. I don't wanna unclog the toilets. Hmm. Um, and I wanna be able to work from anywhere in the country and so this is an awesome opportunity for that, but the number one hurdle for businesses that aren't in a retail space or that aren't brick and mortar is marketing. And so what financial services can offer, or real estate for that matter, that a lot of other career paths can't, is if you do what we ask you to do, you will become an expert in marketing and you will end with followers, whether or not you make this your last career stop. Hmm. And that's tremendously valuable. That's, um, that's been a huge edge for us from a philosophical standpoint. I think tactically, what we found is really beneficial for teams who are recruiting, and teaming is a really trending topic for leaders in our industry now. But what we found is really beneficial is instead of having evergreen jobs like a lot of organizations do, just we'll fill an indefinite number of financial advisors, hmm. we have... Um, we position it to our market or our career advocates or advisors as you know, right now in the, I'm just throwing it out there, the Omaha community, that's where I am today. We have this market pretty well served and this market pretty well served, but we'd really like to recruit an advisor that can help us to better serve the Latino community. So we want somebody who's bilingual. We'd like somebody that ideally went to school in Omaha um, that's from around here so that they have connections. And 
having a um, recruiting to a position, whether that position is to serve a market that your territory covers or a function on the team, like let's say your team needs somebody who's really savvy at case design or somebody that's very good at social media, we actually receive more names than the who do you know questions or you know simple asking for referrals, asking more specifically and what sort of skill sets, personality traits, or markets you're trying to better serve, we found increases the volume of of advisor referrals tremendously. And when you say advisor referrals, you're looking at referrals from your current advisors. Well, could be from our current advisors or people that are uh, being referred to us as candidates in general is, is really what I mean. Got it. So advisors are actually much more likely to help you fill the gap if they know what you're looking for, mm -hmm. unless you just have a stellar culture, they're already used to it. But 99% of the agencies in our industry don't have a culture that they just have tons of referrals pouring in. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get it generated. And the problem be runs into when you have somebody who's actually engaged in giving you names and you give them the right expectations of the selection process and then their friends are getting weeded out. Um, they become uncomfortable with giving yep. you more names. And so to say that I'm looking for somebody who um, is really good at uh, marketing and communications, somebody who uh, is well integrated with the Asian American community or whatever in your area, I think that if they find somebody that whether they fit that criteria exactly or they think kind of outside of the box might help, fill that specific need, they're more likely to start giving you names um, than just the broad base who you know. Um, but but my point with it was just anybody willing to give you candidate referrals. And we've experienced that, obviously, in getting referrals from our a ton. Our a ton. Absolutely. I think it's, you're exactly right, Megan. When you have just more of a pointed selection process of exactly what I'm looking for, mm -hmm. that allows the people that you work with or that you have those contacts and uh, connections to to know exactly who they can point to you in that direction because they know their friends or their family members or whoever better than we do, obviously, and they know if they're going to be really good in this sector or with that community or with whatever project or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we've learned just based off of the agents that we have is that the ones that have done the absolute best came from personal relationships with other current agents. And what we found is it's that belief, like you said, mm -hmm. you're a high believer, right. that belief factor that, oh, John does this. I trust John. John is making good money. John seems to live a, a successful life and I want to go all in on this. And when they come in, we don't have to build that belief on the front end because they already have the belief because they know John's doing well. And I just want to re replicate what John's doing. Mm -hmm. And so for us, that's been huge. Like all of our top agents yep. all came from personal relationships, friendships, uh, some family mm -hmm. uh, from other uh, agents that we have. And so that's been a, a huge avenue for us, but it's been some, something that we've tried to push, and you're exactly right. Like when we try to push it, and someone has a, a referral that does not make it, it number one creates a very awkward situation mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they're like, "Well, why why didn't you take so and so? Why why didn't you contract so and so?" And we're like, "Because so and so wasn't a good fit. Right. Like it's just, right. They just weren't a good fit." Um, and then that person probably is never going to refer anyone to us ever again, more than likely. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, well, and I think we've made the point. It's, you know, that you might want to go out to dinner with somebody, but that might not mean you want to go into business with them. <laughs> yeah. True. And so that's what we focus more when you have a push for referrals, for candidate referrals. Having weekly themes, even if they seem random, are a little bit, or a more fun way to generate volume. So let's say, for instance, um, you know, this week we want to look for people from this school because we're going to be out there next week and that way we can meet with them face to face or it's finals week and we want to make sure we deliver red bulls to the right places mm -hmm. you know those sorts of exciting things they get behind but they don't have as much of an emotional attachment so if they can get excited about something random like it our weekly theme for advisor referrals is anybody that has a gymnastics background or anybody that was a wrestler in high school like those sort of random things, um, they become less attached than the person that it, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, but that person, they were, they would totally crush it. Like, okay, yeah, but 
but our selection process said otherwise, and, and we believe that that's what we have to have faith in over anything else. How much, how much time are you guys spending on creating through different profiling and to different types of testing to know like what your ideal candidates look like. This is a process we've spent a lot of time going through, a lot mm -hmm. of money um, going through and testing all of our top agents and trying to get the kind of like, what's the DNA of someone that has the most propensity to succeed within our organization. The flip side is the frustrating thing is when it doesn't work out that way. When we get someone and we're like, this is like a 10 out of 10, there's right. no way this person's gonna, gonna, gonna fail, and they just bomb. And we're like, does that, do we need to go back to the drawing board? Have we done something wrong? Is that something that you guys are spending a, a ton of time uh, researching on the front end? It's an ongoing research project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what I found the same thing when I work with our local agencies, they get really attached to one or two or sometimes three ideal candidate profiles, and then they plug those profiles in when they've got a live body. And what I've noticed is that at the enter switching from, because I did that as well at the agency level, switching to the enterprise level, what we did was we took a sample size of about 100 people that met both the results in metrics, so activities, mm -hmm. so how much prospecting were they doing, results, how good were they, and then behaviors, did they participate? How many of our leadership calls did they participate in? How many of the things that we had through our value prop did they actively um, participate in? Those were our ideal candidates. They're the ones that hit all of our most important milestones. They're the ones that played full out with everything we had to offer. And they were the ones that, did the, that are continuing to do the activities, even though they might be making a decent amount of money. And so we took about 100 of those people and we looked through their backgrounds, their history, mostly leveraging content on social media to hmm. see not are they motivated and you know are they hardworking, but specifically, what are some common themes? We came up with five character segments, really. We found five different types of people or five really common trends. And we put that into our marketing. Hmm. And with us doing that, we are converting a lot more of the people that click on our ads or become followers of us into candidates. And so I've noticed that we're making slower, more incremental tweaks on those five. Really once a year I look at those and then I add, sometimes I'll have a, a, an experiment with two other uh, trial characters that we dedicate budget dollars to and putting the ideal candidate profile on the marketing and targeting side or sourcing side a lot of recruiters will recognize instead of the selection side um, i found to be a lot more effective because your profile is not going to change that much from day to day it's mm -hmm. really a it, it's really something that will provide you direction with your long game not to provide you direction with how you how you walk through the game in the selection process. That was a big lesson I learned from the field to the home office. And it has been um, a total mind shift change for me. Something that that's, takes a little bit of coaching to share then mm -hmm. with the leaders in our field who see somebody that fits all the criteria but doesn't make it through our selection process. It's hard to emotionally let go of that sometimes. Uh, that makes sense. Perfect sense. And do you see a correlation between, or, or do you see a, 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 a large distinction between those that, that came into your company from the industry versus outside the industry and the amount of time that they last with your company or the success that they have within your company? With us, we found that those that do not have insurance, for example, as a background, they don't come from the insurance industry, um, have done better. Uh, and for us, it's just because they don't have bad habits. Mm -hmm. Clean slate. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't have to reteach. We don't have to erase all this stuff. And they don't come in thinking like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I get like, well, we can go through this training, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 know, I know how to sell mm -hmm. life insurance. And, and the ones that come in and they have zero background where we can just start from scratch have tended to do way, way, way better. Is that something industry-wide that you're seeing? Totally. Yeah. It is. You know, and, and I'll, I'll be honest, there are some companies that are targeting experienced producers and companies I really respect and have home office connections with. And there are some that 
are gung-ho on targeting inexperienced. For us, we've definitely noticed a trend that the, the people that previously had their license, we want to inspire them to get their license. The ones that had previously had their license, they don't stick around as long and their productivity isn't necessarily the right mix, meaning that we're never going to apologize for being a life insurance organization at heart. And while we do push all of our, we're interested in everybody becoming um, securities licensed or fully licensed as a financial advisor, no, no, no ideal household with our clients is going to be built without a solid foundation of insurance. Mm -hmm. And we need people that truly believe that. And so we've shifted our mindset some as we've become really clear on our, on our value proposition to that there have been a few advisors who have come to us because we have attracted so much new uh, talent at the leadership level. There are some that come to us, and this is a bad analogy, so forgive me if you're listening to this and you happen to be one of these people, but I'm, you know, a small town kid, that's the best I got. They're kind of like the bell cows because they are the ones, and Tyler, we talked about this in Southern California, you have an intense program to get people to understand your language, understand your process. They're non-negotiables. There's no freedom within that framework. And so the people that come in that have a license they're the ones that are going to come in that are going to say, Tyler, I want to be the one that comes in, does everything you ask me to do, even though I could probably grind it out and be successful with my, my old way. I want to do everything you ask me to do. And when any new advisor comes and says, why are you so, so successful? I'm going to point to your processes and I'm going to say it's because of you. And there just aren't a lot of experienced producers like that, as I'm sure we all know. Yeah. Um, they're pretty far between, but we have found a couple who are just good people. Maybe the industry changes or regulatory environment has caused them to uh, look elsewhere. And that's really our that's really our caveat. Like, you know, I know you, you're MDRT, you have been, you're tremendously successful, and that's great. But if you're gonna be a part of our career distribution, the pro here, here are the things that are not negotiable for us mm -hmm. and being a part of our of our value prop for first year advisors it you have to participate in it regardless of your experience level and um, I'm very curious to see as we've been we become more authentic with communicating that at the local level we've gotten better at identifying a few of those um, experienced producers who are willing to do everything I'm curious if in a couple of years you ask me the same question, mm -hmm. if my experience on how much production and their product mix, how long they've stayed is different than what I feel today. Because I think it might be. Sure. One of our favorite sayings around here is you can't feed your family and your ego at the same time. Right. And that seems to be the, the issue there is that people just, whether they want to do it their old way or just want to do it their own way. Mm -hmm. um, it's just some people, don't have the ability to just say, okay, you guys have figured it out. Right. I'm just gonna go do that, and I'm just gonna go do uh, a lot of it. Um, one thing I'd love to transition into is, once you do have a, a, a candidate, you, they're contracted, they come on board, it's such a fragile, fragile, fragile period of time in those first days, those first weeks, those first months, in order to get, number one, a check in their hand, which builds the most belief, mm -hmm. But number two, that training process and onboarding process to where they can feel that culture that may have drawn them in and like have that, oh wow, it really is like this and that excitement that builds and making sure that that part just runs extremely smoothly. What are some of the things that you guys are doing during that fragile period of time to set these people up for success, which ultimately sets you guys up for success from a recruiting standpoint? So marketing plan is a big part of what we focus on. It's a prerequisite to our um, launch class, which they happen monthly for us. It, and new advisors all come into class at the same time. You're either part of our you know, June class, July class. And the prerequisite to that is really filling out a uh, your initial market that includes there's at the point you've actually come on board with us and and are officially in class, there's names and phone numbers, but initially it's demographic information. Mm -hmm. So we can identify, okay, this person knows a lot of young professionals that are married with kids. A lot of them are, are in the office <clears throat> space area. So we wanna try to identify what companies, what do their benefits look like? 
what advisor relationships are there, et cetera. And so when they're going through that launch class, we have a lot of um, plugs to the value of becoming an expert in marketing. And I think that there's a lot of that that really builds confidence in those who are gonna make it. And quite honestly, it's another check and balance for people that maybe don't have the heart for prospecting that slip through our selection process because we do mm -hmm. still have some opt outs at that point. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to have conviction. And if somebody gets, you know, creeped out by the idea of prospecting during launch week, then uh, it doesn't have to be a negative thing. In fact, we probably did both parties a huge favor help them transition somewhere else. Yeah. And I think that that has been a real positive for both the, the people that stayed in those launch classes and the people um, that did decide that it wasn't for them because I've seen a lot of lives wrecked by trying to hang on to this career for too long mm -hmm. um, and it's not the right thing. And then I think you can't forget to re-recruit people. <laughs> you know, you wow. people, Great. people forget about the re-recruiting and you know there's a lot to be said from hearing value from the top down even i uh there's a lot of stuff that i have to do on a regular basis that involves courage or that i have to encourage my team to execute on and the more that they hear that language from you know senior management or they hear you're, you're doing a good thing for your community and pat on the back I think the better, um, the more they'll be willing to grind and work hard before they've earned the right to work smart, that we are talking about. Um, so that's another thing. So it's the, the tie back to the value prop. For us, it's the marketing and development is a lot of it. Mm -hmm. the, the connection to the overall organizational mission is huge for millennials. And then I think there's just some tactical things that, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to travel and visit agencies for five years now and um, all across the country. And so I've observed some things that I think would make the first day, first week, first month a lot easier. You know, one of the ideas when I get the keys to my own agency someday is, you know, I want to I want to cater to working parents because most people are working parents mm -hmm. and if you're an advisor, you know, one of the first things you're going to get from me is a meal plan and instructions on how to do your groceries online order <laughs> because yes. I think it's really important it's Absolutely. the little things that you know you feel I feel guilty when I'm not at home and I feel guilty when I'm not at work and helping coach those people through their first Monday night phone clinic when they have no milk at home hmm. is really important yeah that makes a lot of sense and and, and during that fragile period of time communication for us is critical Huge. like it's the it's the quickest indicator from someone's beginning of the end mm -hmm. <laughs> is when you yeah. haven't heard from someone and hey have you have you t talked to so and so lately no no i haven't well what's going on well let's reach out to him you don't get a call back and you just know it's it's the it's, it's just the beginning of the end um and Something I think with millennials in particular, this aspect of collaboration, this aspect of working as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we've used uh, is just this app called Voxer, and it's like a basically a, a walkie-talkie app. But we have all of our new agents that are starting at the same time. They get on to this team. It's actually called Team Hustle Hard because they're again working, <laughs> working hard, not smart at that point. Right. Uh, but Team Hustle Hard, where they're going on there, and whether it's someone that's studying for the insurance license or whether it's someone that's been doing this for a couple of months and they're out there crushing it in the field, they're constantly out there, you know, updating on Voxer like, hey, just got out of this appointment, just you know, sold a policy to this guy, and this thing happened, and this is how I overcame it, and and this. This, this constant communication to where that person that quite frankly kind of feels like they're an island you know they mm -hmm. feel like oh well crap I, I I came on board with this company but I still live in Omaha and the company's based in South Carolina and for them to have those touch points to where it's you know midnight but someone's probably up at some part of the country that they can hop on there mm -hmm. and have a conversation with uh, has been critical for us to retain those people I think it's been a huge thing with our uh, retention uh, are there any other communication type tools that you guys have put in place to make sure that these people are are feeling part of the team I like the Voxer um, yeah. 
a lot. I think Voxer is really helpful for us. Um, I've heard it used kind of creatively from time to time as, you know, let's say somebody is running behind if you're in a heavily populated area and they've got an appointment, they can box somebody, hey, are you on the side of the city? Hmm. Supposed to be meeting a client, I'm not gonna make it, or I've got a sick kiddo at home. Yeah. Those sorts of things can be really helpful for a boxer tool. But I think that for me, it's uh, it's text messaging and phone calls yeah. are a lot of how, um, how I communicate with our team. We have a team um, text channel and that's what I've seen most commonly used in our agencies as well. Just something that ha is a voice for, or a space for everybody to, mm -hmm. to have a chat stream. Yeah. Boxer, you can accomplish that. Chat, you can as well, um, or excuse me, text, you can as well, and I think that's really important. Awesome. Well, just talk real briefly, and then, and then we'll we'll be done here. The, you kind of mentioned chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. I know this is something that you're going to be rolling out here pretty soon. So maybe touch on that a little bit because I think people will be excited, especially those in this field, uh, excited to learn more about the success that you've had and some of those more tactical things that they can start implementing with their businesses. Touch on that, if you will, kind of timeline and what that's going to look like for people. Thanks, yeah, so I will be sharing uh, kind of the, the dirty details behind the path of the disruptor from a tactical standpoint. Chapter one, um, really starting out in the, what are some of the leadership skills you need to hone in on to refine your skills and, and be more disruptive on purpose. And chapter two, some of the stuff we talked about as an advisor and how to better relate to new advisors, things to look out for. Um, chapter three will be really recruiting and selection at an agency level culturally where do you need to be and how do you need your team to behave and what do you need them to execute on and then from a home office perspective really talking about sourcing and marketing at a higher level and how to really speak to the vision and the direction that you're headed um, I think that the the importance behind the the series is to share some of the lessons that I've learned, but for the next four weeks, I'm gonna break down each chapter and I'm gonna revisit the lessons because I think those are very important things to keep in mind, uh, hopefully motivate somebody who's maybe on the edge of being a disruptor. But for each chapter over the next four weeks, I'm gonna share ideas uh, on tactically how to execute and hopefully achieve some of the same success I have. And, and where are you gonna be rolling that out? Is it gonna be on LinkedIn? Between LinkedIn and Instagram. Okay, and so where can everybody find you on LinkedIn and Instagram? So on LinkedIn, you can find me at, you know, my, my LinkedIn URL is at Meg Wilkie. Um, and then Megan Wilkie with Mutual of Omaha is a pretty easy way to find me. And then on Instagram, I'm Prophetessa. Which I love, <laughs> Prophetessa. That is awesome. Thank you. So this has been extremely valuable for, yeah, for me, and I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of it. So I want to make sure people do connect with you online. So make sure that you do follow uh, Prophetessa on Instagram uh, and Megan on, um, on LinkedIn. And I think it's funny, coming out of this event, it really doesn't matter the industry. Like we talked about financial services, insurance, and at the event we also talked about real estate. But the reality is, whether you're on the recruiting side, whether you're on the actual agency side, whether you're out there just marketing a product, you're either going to be disrupted or be the disruptor over this next, I think three to five years is kind of the big push. And what are traditionally with us, very traditional fields, very stuck in their ways of marketing and doing things that have worked for a long time, and that's great, but what worked for a long time isn't necessarily gonna work moving right. forward. Uh, and I think it's very, very uh, awesome for you and for us to be on that front side of, of where things are of where things are headed um, because obviously that's going to capture a lot more talent uh, and then ultimately be able to retain it so I, I really really thank you uh, for joining us today I, I got a lot out of it absolutely thank you so much for having me it was nice to finally meet you I hope to yeah. um, I hope to keep the channel of communication open absolutely. So guys, with that, this is episode 69 of the Sales Wolves podcast. Again, I'm Tyler Harris. Jillian Wells. 
Megan Wilkie. And we are the Sales <laughs> Wolves. Ow! Guys can do that so much better than girls, just I, saying. I hope, I hope everyone in your office really enjoyed that, that how. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you so much. And everybody, join us next time. Till then, we'll see you.